When I hear the phrase, I think of when you are out cheering and you're trying to catch one of those last weathers and he flies through the air, headbutts you in the eye, uh, leaves you with a nice bruiser, and then you continue shearing. You get it done. You figure out a way to, to make it work despite everything that may be mounting against you. Uh, that's what I think about. And then you plan the next butchery. <laughs> Yes, we are joined with Nanaba Chakon, who, if you have been traveling the streets of Gallup, if you have wandered through Albuquerque, you have seen her work. And so we are super excited to bring on this muralist today. Kayla Jackson is going to be joining us today to help lead this conversation uh, with Nanaba as she tells us a little bit about um, the challenges and successes that she's faced as a Navajo muralist. So without further ado, Kayla. So hi, hi everybody, I'm Kayla, but I, I recently graduated from Danette College and I was given the opportunity to find different influential Navajo artisans and I chose Nanaba because she's a substantial muralist and I just enjoy her work and I would love for Nanaba to introduce herself. Nakai donne bashishin kiani dashishche nakai donne dashanale. Um, I'm happy to be here, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining me in my home and here in Albuquerque. Um, I've been working as a professional artist for about the past, um, I want to say. 15 years, in the past 10 years, I've been focusing on mural and public work pieces. And within that, a lot of the work that I do is focused on community engagement. So bringing in, making works in communities, but also bringing in the people from those communities to help me create and facilitate the, the pieces. Um, I'm also a painter and uh, in all of these works that I do, um, I always, I think it's important to bring to the forefront um, the ideas and philosophies of Indigenous people and Indigenous communities. And um, also to bring a presence to women in our communities. So a lot of my work, you you might see throughout this, or maybe when I refer to pieces, um, that there is a lot of a lot of women in my work, and um, a lot of layers between philosophy and culture, and where we are right now in our society. Thank you for that. And that was beautiful. I, I know I, your, all of your work is more female centric and I really enjoy that because we as Navajo people are very much, we're a matrilineal society and seeing your paintings, it gives me 
a lot of hope and a lot of pride being a Navajo woman and seeing that your work is out there for everyone to see and to understand the philosophies that we are brought up with and them to appreciate it is very, is, it's awesome. <laughs> so we'll get on with the, the conversation. So what challenges have you had to overcome as a Navajo artist? Um, I, I think to be a professional artist is, is difficult at first, you know, um, mostly because I think that a lot of Western culture, um, capitalism, our ideas of capitalism and success don't really foster the idea for, um, an artist to be a successful person. And I think overcoming that stigma and also like the idea of a woman being an independent artist contractor. Um, I notice that when I tell people that I'm an artist, they're like, oh, what else do you do? <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, this is what I do. But, and sometimes I tell people I own my own business because mm -hmm. that is really what I do as an artist is my, my practice is my business and my practice is how I sustain myself and how I make money. And it, when I present it in that way, when I say that about my practice and what I do, people take me seriously because it's not just about creating art or create, having this like um, loose idea about what an artist is. It's actually understanding that there is, um, that there's a value to that. There's a value to my work and my ethic and my business and my practice that um, needs to be valued in other ways. So that, that I think is, is definitely been a hard challenge um, is just kind of having the strength to, to believe that I can do this every single day, that I'm doing it on my own. Um, I'm doing it as a single mother. I'm doing it, um, you know, just completely, this is, this is the, whole, the whole package <laughs> in front of you, you know, the whole yeah. business, the whole production, the whole, you know, I'm writing all the emails, everything. So, um, you know, that in every, every single in in a lot of ways in every single way that's that's the biggest challenge um from 15 years ago till right now mm -hmm. and continue with that and then also be able to have the um to be not over so overwhelmed by that aspect that the work that i make is still um very true to what I want to produce, that I'm not making work just to make money and I'm not making work just to, you know, like sell up in Santa Fe and have some kind of idea around it, you know, that I'm making work that's really true to what, what is feeding my soul and my heart and feeding the ideas I want to get out there and, and that I'm staying true to that. So that um, is also a very very large challenge to, you know, center myself and put myself back in, in to put things into perspective of why, why I am an artist. That's a very good point because I am in the art leadership management out in Colorado State University. I'm getting a master's in that and just they do, they don't understand that we as Navajo people have been in this cultural industry for centuries and centuries before and now they're trying to colonize it in a way where they're going to benefit the most and so now I am challenging them saying that like hey we don't have to think about it as a capitalism way we can think of it as how to sustain the communities that are being involved and induced into this and just having that and hearing that you're you're very passionate about that, you're very community driven, that is something that I think as a Navajo person, that's that's what we think about. We think about our community, the people that are going to express what we, we what what we are creating. And it's very interesting that you're you you think that way and it's very it's very refreshing to hear you say that. Yeah. Um I always like to think about art in general as being um, a way to communicate 
and, and it communicates on a level that is different from, you know, reading. And I think we can even understand movies as communication and we understand media and we understand music as communication. But visual art is something that sometimes we don't always hold to that same degree when it becomes just about art and ideas. And so sometimes when I have to explain the value of the work that, that I'm doing or the value that an artist is doing um, is to explain it in a way that this is, I'm, a, I'm communicating an idea, a thought, um, and it can be very complex. It can be a socio-economic political issue, you know, <laughs> but nothing is gonna make that come across um, the way that the imagery that I use can. Um, and that's going to impact people in a different way. So, so that has to be valued. The, the, that has to be valued in the same way. And it has to be a val valued, um, especially when it's uh, coming from indigenous people, is that we are, we are the authentic source for these experiences. And these experiences cannot be matched by you know understanding it on the internet or you know hearing something or even just by mimicking the aesthetic it really has to come from that experience um and i feel that way about a lot every culture which is why in my practice when i do public art pieces and i do is basically coming from this place that I can't prescribe what is best for a community. For me to go into another community and put up my work and expect there to be a conversation, to be this relaying of information without consulting with that community, without bringing in that community, without having those conversations and those connections prior, there's no way that I could prescribe what that community needs, wants, or is about. Um, so for me, that's a very cent central part of my practice um, because I think that in order for me to create those connections when I create murals, um, I have to start on a personal level first. Mm -hmm. I know that you use the Navajo culture, the ideologue, the idealism in your work. How how do you reflect on that? Do you what is your process on on choosing a, a, like a Navajo cultural object or just an idea? How do you go about that? So a lot of the work that I do, um, I think I, I, I like it to be layered. Um, mm -hmm. And it's different from, I think, the way that we've seen a lot of murals, like the history of murals kind of look um, which I think is mostly um, narrative and kind of have this narrative format, like maybe they would talk about um, something historical and then along the wall there would kind of be this, you know, um, kind of sequence of images that told that story and you could kind of see that unfold and it would, that's how they would direct a, a message. For me, I like to really think about um, the way that philosophy, like Navajo teachings, philosophy, my culture have impacted the way that I think. And then turn that into an image that's also related to the environment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then kind of put that back out. Because I think a lot of the things that are, you know, we're taught, um, in our philosophies and ceremonies and our way of thinking are very sacred. Mm -hmm. And I don't ever want to miscommunicate something um, that is maybe not my place to, to put out there. I, 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 what I can put out there is what my own thoughts, my own feelings, my own images are and and put that out into the world to have a conversation back and forth around an idea. Um, and I think it's very important to talk about our thoughts and philosophies in the way that that's impacted um, our being. I mean, for me, that's really what it is to be Diné, is to understand this side of my culture. I mean, there's, we see a lot of the things that are 
that are beautiful in our culture a lot. You know, we see the squash blossoms and we see, you know, our rug designs and, you know, all of these things that are, that are, uh, part of our culture. But for me, the, the things that are most important and the things that make me feel connected, the things that let me know that I am, um, a Diné woman is that the way that I was raised and the way that I was learned to be in the world. So those are the things that I think are, um, that I want, that I want to, create the the intrigue around and uh like a good example of that is there is an Im uh, mural that i think i included in the slides the it's the manifestations of glittering world and it's the woman and she's got a like a fistful of sand manifestations of glittering world and this was done in santa fe and one of the things that i think when i am in santa fe that um, because it's a very large tourist, I want to say crossroads, is people don't realize how this place, this center, this area has always been a city. It's always been a place of commerce and trade, and people from all over have always gathered there. And I really liked, um, like the idea of, and it, I don't want to say even liked, I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea that this world is the glittering world, because I think it, it's very prophetic, and I, I appreciate our ancestors and the knowledge that we have, that, that they had, that we, don't, we can't even understand sometimes. And so I thought about the idea of it being the white world, the glittering world, and what that means, what that means for right now. Um, and when we think about those terms of like talking about this time as being the glittering world, um, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, we begin to start to think about bling culture and we start to think about um, all the things that we have in here that are, that glitter, all of the the buildings and the lights and you know all of those all of those connotations that kind of speak to that and so this image is really a um kind of our emergent story of coming up through the the sand but then also contemplating our time right now um, and these this design is a design i came up with and i like I did this kind of moment where I was doing a lot of um, kind of this overlapping of rug patterns and, and um, images of, of people, figures. And because I wanted them to kind of tell the, the story or the idea together. Um, and this design, I did it kind of, you know, using framing her within these, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but probably not, but these, you know, she's framed in by like these kind of mountain motifs. But um, as it goes off to, I guess it would be the, the right side, this mural is a little bit longer, it kind of breaks up and starts to look more like buildings. Um, and then, you know, using the cross kind of uh, motifs to look like light you know, like when you squint your eyes and you look at light. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, you see this image and, and you can take it for what it is. Sometimes I make work that I think a, a lot of people can understand. And sometimes I make work that is specifically for Diné people to understand. And, and there's symbols in that and there's, um, layers within that that I, I think are meant meant for us too. So um, yeah, so that's that's just like kind of an example of um, me kind of putting together those images. Do you have another example from like a different community that is not Navajo based? Do you have a sample of that? When I do community engaged work, it's really different. Um, I over this uh, about a month ago, I did a mural in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and for that piece, it's 
it was a it's a very long wall it's about a hundred feet long and what i what it's depicted is three three sets of of feet <laughs> um, <laughs> with moc <laughs> with moccasins on and and they're in a, a dancing motion so you just see kind of maybe from from the ankles down and um they're in you know they're in different positions from from dancing and i i began that piece um it, it was a little bit more challenging right now to do community engaged work i think in part of my process is usually coming up with this imagery and these ideas with the community but i had started this piece actually just kind of coming from a place because we couldn't meet with anybody. We couldn't see anybody face to face because of social distancing protocols and, and uh, everything else. And um, so I really started this piece um, just thinking about what I missed. You know, I haven't really done anything the entire year and I was missing that. I'm missing connecting with people and missing going out to the res and missing my family and even here, you know, missing going to powwows and missing my native community here. And I started thinking about the ways that we connect um, and what those connections mean. And so I really felt like dancing um, was a big part of that and really it it connects us to ceremony it connects us to our communities it connects us to the earth um, and prayer and it's also joyous and celebratory and you know we haven't had time to do that this year I, as native people in so many capacities everybody all Inter through so many tribes, you know, everybody that I talk to, friends from, you know, up north and all over, you know, they're, they're missing, they're missing that and I am too. And so I really felt like that was, that was the imagery I wanted to create. And when I got to Tulsa, um, I worked with a group called Post Traditional and they're, they're a group of women. And they lent me um, some images of their moccasins and leggings from the design patterns from out there. So um, I incorporated that into the design. And for me, that felt like a good way to connect with the community and to be able to, um, ah, there it is, yeah. So. I think you can find on the internet. So thank you. To <laughs> 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 yeah, so um, yeah, that, that, that is the piece that um, was created. And there's uh, the, the tall grass that they have out there, the, the uh, they call it Indian grass. Um, and yeah, so for me, that was, that was a way to incorporate the community, bring them together and, and also um, be able to create that work safely, social distancing. <laughs> Um, um, but still be able to incorporate them into that work. Have you always been a muralist? Like you always done large work or were you always like kind of on a canvas most of the time? Oh, um, well, I started out as a teenager doing graffiti. Um, I didn't really make art before then. Uh, yeah, and graffiti really changed my life. It really, I mean, it taught me everything really it i mean the foundations of me learning art in that way taught me so so much um so i would say that i learned when i first learned to like mark make and make my own mark making um i mean of course when you're a kid everybody likes to draw and do that sort of thing but when i started really taking aesthetic and style and um you know, thinking about kind of these layers that happen when you when you make a piece of artwork, it really happened through graffiti. And I did that for about 10 years. I didn't really do any other kind of artwork and it was all illegal. It was on weird surfaces. It was on walls, on trains, on bridges, whatever. Um, and then 
when I had my son, I got into doing canvases and painting and focusing more on figurative work. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I, you know, I wasn't in the capacity to be out there being naughty <laughs> um, and like getting in trouble and, yeah. you know, doing all the kind of stuff. You know, I had different responsibilities. My life was changing. So I, um, yeah, I, I started working on, on canvases. And when I did that, I, I really, um, I learned a lot from looking at, at uh, old illustrators, like from the 1920s. I really liked pinup art. And I think that's really where I started kind of formulating the ideas of I wanted to paint a lot of um, Native women. I wanted to paint Diné women and brown women um Chicana women I'm I'm Chicana and and Dene and um because I didn't see that you know I didn't see any of it I was looking at all of these artists and all of this material and all of these illustrations and I would never see ones of of um of women that look like me so or any or my aunties or my grandma or anybody so um that's that's really where I started kind of doing that because I think when you're making art you should make the art that you want to see you know mm -hmm. you should make the art you haven't seen you should make the art that you think should exist so that's what I did so when you choose the women in your paintings do you think of like your aunties or your sisters or somebody do you have somebody in mind when you paint them or is it just all from memory um Sometimes I I have I sent you guys an image it was a painting I did last year, um, and it's a, a woman she's holding a baby, okay. and um, there's and it has more pueblo motifs. It's got an avanu, yeah, this one, um, and this piece is called the embodiment of water. And when I was thinking of this, when I made this piece, um, I was thinking of actually my sister and she had a baby last year. And um, I was thinking about just the connections that wa water has um, in so many ways that, you know, we're, we're made of water, water sustains us in life. Um, and also thinking about the idea of storms and kind of the adversity we feel with water, um, even though it's so sacred and it's part of us. And really kind of thinking just metaphorically about the idea of a storm and like having this kind of, you know, abundance of water that can be kind of scary but then having that always produce life and having it be a cycle of life. And so I, I thought of this image first. Um, and then I started kind of thinking about um, just imagery, like the images I was, I had worked last year with um, some Pueblo artists and had really appreciated their their ideas and philosophies around water and the sacredness of them and was looking at a lot of their pottery and was really appreciating the, the beauty of that. And so I really put these images together to really kind of tell that story. So it came from somewhere personal. This looks nothing like my sister. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, I, it, it, you know, it doesn't look like her. Um, mm -hmm. I think the baby in some way, it looks like my niece, but that wasn't intentional. It wasn't like from a photo of her, but I, a lot of the times I start with kind of this feeling, right? Like this feeling that is personal at first, but then it can kind of evolve into its own thing and, um, you know, add, add layers on top of that to, to, to bring it to what it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no, I, I like the, I like illustrating, um, and kind of evolving these characters or these figures, because 
I think then they become their own person. They, be, they have their own entity and their own spirit. Um, there has been a few times I have captured actual people I know and, um, you know, painted them exactly as they are. But um, I do like to work in a more illustrative way and, and let them become their own thing. I also think it lets people see themselves in it if it's not attached to a specific person. Um, then they begin to see, put their own narrative into that work. And I think that's important. What most inspires your work? Um, it's, it's, my, it's my language. Mm -hmm. um, it's the way that I communicate. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, I guess it would be like if I was a writer or a musician or, you know, maybe I gardened or cooked or something, but I don't. I, I paint and I make art and I draw. And so it's the thoughts that I think about. Um, it's in inspiration comes in all sorts of different ways. I've been inspired by just like light, <laughs> like, you know, the way that light is hitting something. Um, I've been inspired by the season and I've been inspired by people or, you know, just ideas or a feeling. So, um, but using what I know how as a painter and illustrator, it's my way to communicate that. So um, that's why I do that. You've sent over an image of the of a ride with flowers on it. Do you what was that? Can you explain that one? Oh yeah. Um, and oh, okay. Do, do, are you gonna put it up? Um, this is a painting I did two years ago, mm -hmm. um, and it's really large. It's um, I think it's four feet high by um, maybe about eight feet long, something like that. Um, but it's, it's pretty large. It's currently actually hanging at the Herd Museum right now as part of a pretty great in, um, exhibition. I grew up in Albuquerque and I also grew up in Chinle. Uh, like I said, I'm bicultural. And growing up out here, um, lowrider culture is definitely a big, a big part of the culture that you see here. It's a big part of Chicano culture. And I began this painting kind of thinking about um, the idea of the aesthetic of beauty and what two cultures can kind of think about as being beautiful. And I absolutely love cars. I love lowriders. I hope I own this car one day. This is like maybe part of like my own manifestation of like what I want in life. Um, it's, yeah. it's painted to scale, um, <laughs> the exact scale of the car. And it was really about combining um, these two aesthetics of beauty, right? Um, painting just the, the quintessential rose painting um, and the beauty of a rose and then kind of overlapping it with this car. And a lot of times with my work, I like to play with kind of this overlapping and transparency of images because I want them to exist as one thought and maybe for that to match a little bit more the way that we think or that we see the world as kind of um, we can have ideas or experiences that are maybe a, a paradox or that um, juxtapose one another, but in our mind they can make sense. And so really this is this conversation of, of the idea of beauty and really making something that is completely unattainable, something that can't exist in real life, but yet um, in a painting it can exist as kind of this aesthetic of, of um, absolute beauty. So yes, yeah, so that, that's that work. I, 
I'm shifting my, the work that I do to being a lot more large scale. I like painting large scale. Um, I think it's like the way that I'm most comfortable painting. I sometimes, I have done small paintings in the past, but um, for right now, everything that I've done has been at least um, four feet high and you know whatever expanding even the one that i had just shown with the woman and the baby the embodiment of water um mm -hmm. that piece i think is three feet by two feet so oh wow i've never ventured into a big canvas or a mural of that sort so i can't imagine the proportions and everything mapping it out and just putting it on the wall is just something so foreign to me, but I enjoy your work a lot. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. What advice would you offer to like young and aspiring Navajo artisans? Do you have any words of encouragement or an advice or all the advices? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say, um, you know, just, be true to what you really want to create as weird and as like against the grain that might be, or maybe it's not like what might be popular at the time or whatever, but your story, your experience, the way you think, um, I think especially being Dine, because we, we were able to to navigate our cultural side and we're able to also navigate you know um like the colonized american world you know and then also the global world you know mm -hmm. like there's so so many layers and i think for me i'm always thankful that um that i have you know, I don't, I don't have to reach real far to understand what that's like. And I think that that makes us very smart and very unique and very, our, our, the way that we make work and see work very precious. And I would just encourage anybody who's, who's an artist just to keep, keep doing what they're doing and keep pushing themselves, keep trying to think of new ways to communicate and express those ideas, experiment, um, you know, never, never, uh, now I'm learning to like say no and kind of push, kind of filter things. But for a long time, I never said no to any experience or opportunity. Um, because sometimes you just don't know where it's going to take you. So, you know, don't be afraid in those kind of experiences. Um, and if you, you have that opportunity to do something, um, do it. it. It may change, change the way that you see, um, you know, the world or even yourself or your practice. And, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for all of those bits of risk taking that I took. Um, I never, you know, if I, if I would go back, you know, 25 years, and think that I would ever be an artist full time, you know, and painting like gigantic, you know, 100 feet, 100 feet of wall space or whatever, you know, 6,000 feet, square feet of wall space. I would have never believed that, but, but here I am, you know, and it's because I took risks and I just kind of, a lot of the times dove in feet first um, and just kind of did it. So yeah, I, I think, you can you can pretty much do anything and i'm excited to see that that come about from newer artists i'm always excited to see new work yeah thank you for that i think you gave all the advice that we need <laughs> and i know <laughs> we, there's a lot of students that are on here so i'm like how can we inspire the students here how can we think because we all come from different different houses different hogans different families and we all have different oral stories that were given to us and now it's winter time and we get to hear those stories again hopefully and like we could easily translate it and not to a way where we're kind of not disrespecting the oral side the traditional side but conceptually thinking about it and putting it on a canvas or in a digital media work or anything so 
I think you're a great example of a of a Navajo artist who does that, the juxtaposition and understanding how we can be successful in that way. And that's very inspiring and it's 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 wonderful. Thank okay. you. Yeah, the only other advice I would give is um mm -hmm. to look at a lot of art. Like look at you, you know, if you are Sometimes I think as artists, we can get really stuck in our medium and be kind of only interested in our medium. And, you know, I would look at everything. You know, if you're a painter, look at sculptures, look at installation, look at, at jewelry and small metals, um, you know, and vice versa. Look at digital, you know, look at experimental works and minimalism and architecture, you know. I, I mean, these are... When I was, um, you know, doing graffiti, I was really kind of narrow in a lot of ways. And um, when I went to school, I, I had an opportunity to, I worked in, at the art museum when I started going to UNM. And, um, you know, I saw stuff like minimalism and I didn't understand it. And I think now I really love minimalism and I really see the connections to what I was doing as a graffiti writer to the way that minimalist artists were trying to think. And I think, you know, all of these things, even though it's something I would have never liked or understood, in some way it filters into your way of thinking and being. And I actually, you know, in a lot of ways, sometimes see my work as being more abstract or conceptual than I do it, even though I'm like kind of almost like a very traditional painter. Like I do figurative stuff and I do representational stuff, but the way that I come to those imageries, to that imagery and to those concepts is really kind of thinking in, in uh, different, different ways um, to bring, to kind of hone in my idea. So look at a bunch of stuff, like everything all the time. <laughs> okay. okay thank you okay so now i'm going to ask the last the very last questions how do you explain the phrase all with a bit uh, that one is hard um also because it's like i guess i've only known it in like as an expression or like as a um, like as a way, um, but I think it it means like perseverance and like hard work, and but being able to to come out of that hard work feeling good, mm -hmm. feeling good about it in the end, and um, that's basically like being an artist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of hard work. Yeah. It's a lot. Of work um and it's a lot of perseverance um but at the end of it I, I can't imagine doing anything else so one of the questions that we had come in uh was coming from actually one of our instructors here at the college uh dr caleb uh, carla Britton. she asked you know do you have any thoughts on the proliferation of recent coronavirus inspired murals and street art in, in general, in the way street art, I think, is being handled right now is um, there's a really large um, kind of propaganda, um, I want to say, motive behind it. And I think that that can be very powerful. It can be very powerful for our movements and for awareness and... Um, you know, for, for being able to, like, reminders and being able to engage uh, our communities and, and for them to understand. Because I think what's very important about um, public work is that you are reaching everybody, you know. It's, it doesn't have the confines of being in a museum or a gallery or any kind of institution. Um, it's out there on the streets. So there is a lot of um, a lot of interest to to make work around that, and I think it's important as well. Um, yeah, I, I haven't made any coronavirus work, but you know, I I've, I appreciate the work that's out there around that because I think that there is a need to um, to really have those messages out there. 
Yeah, I mean, and it offers a great perspective of just everyday realities. We, we, we get that opportunity. Kind of along the same line is, uh, even though you haven't been, you know, you haven't created like a specific mural directly related to uh, the coronavirus, how has the pandemic changed your mural art in any fashion? Yeah, it, it, I mean, the pandemic has just changed life in general. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, all of us have experienced the spectrum of what that actually means. Um, and, uh, you know, the summertime and in the spring is is a very busy time for me usually. It's, it's the time that I do you know, the majority of my work for the year. And, and this year, a lot of those projects were halted, you know, or they were pushed into next year. Um, and because it, it just was not um, feasible to be out on the street when we were shelter in place and kind of at the kind of depths of, of quarantine and doing all of that. So I really respected that, you know, I think we have to respect, um, respect things we don't, that are bigger than us, you know, <laughs> like, like a virus we don't know about. So I really had a lot of respect for that. Um, I didn't make any work. The piece in Tulsa was really the only piece that I, like the large piece that I, I did. Um, I had a few other smaller projects that I worked on, um, but I think, I think it's it's been different because it's really shifting the format of what community engaged work can be. Like I said during you know this talk was that I really enjoy connecting with people, especially when I travel. A lot of my work relies on travel. I didn't travel at all, um, so there's a lot of limitations, a lot of things that kind of you know we're navigating and. But I also think that as an artist, I'm here to kind of figure out that stuff. You know, I'm not so um, concrete with my process that I, I'm not, that I, I can't shift it, you know? And I think that shifting it is really what uh, enables me to learn and to grow as an artist and even as, you know, a person. And um, so, yeah. That it's it's been a challenge, but it's also you know kind of working its way out as it continues on, and yeah, I mean I know my process before the virus, so right now it's just kind of like a learning period, I guess. Oh, uh, one of the questions that we do have is, you know, is there a specific cause or you know other issue that you like to address in your in your work? I like to put women in the forefront of my work because I just think that we do not see enough. We don't see enough indigenous women. I think that we, we work against a culture um, in larger urban areas that really attempts to erase an indigenous culture. Um, so I think I have the agency as an artist, as a public works artist, to be very obtuse with the images that I make. And because of that, I want to put something, I, wa I want to put women in the forefront of that because I just don't think that there's been enough space carved out for that. And if I can do it, then I am. And so, um, so that's why I do that. Uh, I think it's very important. I think about that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 40 years old and I think that the majority of my life um, as a young woman, I didn't see it even, I mean, I live in Al Chinle and I live here in Albuquerque and even in Albuquerque, as diverse as we are and as many um, tribes and nations that we have around us, I still didn't see that you know, and I didn't see it in authentic ways. I saw these kind of stereotyped representations of it. So for me, I think it's very important to, to show authentic images, to come to show um, history, to show the people that have been here on this land that have been connected to this land um, and still are here. And 
um, you know, very make make that presence very seen. So that's that's why I, I I centralize women. I think that there's enough opportunities that we've seen men be centralized in art. <laughs> not that they're not important, but you know, we've seen enough of it, and I really I really just take the opportunity because I can. What has been your favorite mural that you've worked on so far? Like, is there one that just sticks out and you're like, that was, yep, that was, that was the one. <laughs> there, there's, I mean, there's a few. I wouldn't say that there's one, but I would say that there's a few for different reasons. Um, I think probably one of the more personal pieces that I really love, and I think I included a photo of it, is um, a piece called Nada de Shosh, and it's my grandpa's hands. Um, and that was done, uh, up at inscription, inscription house. And that also, because it, I mean, it's, it's, it's my Che, <laughs> uh, it's, it, this, his hands and the, the, the process of creating that work was, was very special. Um, I took a photo of of my grandpa's hands he he's actually had has dementia and if anyone has ever had a, a relative or loved one that's that's gone through that you know that there's hard days that they go through and um he was having a, a difficult day and my grandma had given him this pan of corn um the dried corn to to do that with and I had never seen him actually do that before and when he did it he was singing and it was it calmed him down and he remembered and um, when this mural came about it's on the senior center out in inscription house and I really wanted to create something that honored our um, our elders and the knowledge of our elders and kind of connected it to now because I just think that there's so much knowledge that our elders have and even like I don't I didn't ever know this because it's not something that I've had to do to sustain myself you know um so when I saw him doing it it's I think it's it's an act it's work but it was also beautiful and it was beautiful the way that he sang in the way that it was like almost like a reflex memory. So I like this piece because I look at it and, you know, I, I know my grandpa's hands. I, <laughs> I, know, I, I mean, I've seen him my whole life. And so when I see it, I, I remember his hands and I remember that time. So that's probably, probably my favorite, my favorite piece really a beautiful piece and I mean it just reaches out to so many different people and so many different stories so it's um and I can totally see why it's where it's at so I we have um two uh two more questions for you coming in from our chat um one super practical and then one is also just for curiosity purposes uh super practical Andrea uh, she's actually one of our BFA students here she wants to know what's your favorite spray paint that you like to use I don't use spray paint any more on murals because um, it doesn't last. It's, I mean, uh, I guess like in a practical logistical way, um, it it's a very thin layer of paint that that's being applied, and so um, it just over time it just doesn't last. I use um, a couple of acrylic paints, one Nova Color or Golden, they both make a mural paint, which you can buy in large quantities. Um, and it's really great paint, it, it lasts, it's beautiful, it's vibrant. Um, it also has like a UV factor, so it doesn't fade. It's basically gonna keep its vibrancy for you know over 30 years. And other than that, I also use use exterior house paint and these are just because of durability issues. I've used spray paint on murals before and it fades and you know you put in that time and that content and you know these works. Of course all of them are ephemeral. All of them are going to 
die or go away or get painted over at some point. Um, but I think I want that to happen as a result of the environment, not necessarily the materials that I use. So yeah, um, but there are a lot of great uh, spray paints out there to use. I mean, the you know, back from when I used to do graffiti, we had basically like Krylon and, um, you know, like just a few other, Rust-Oleum and a few other brands, but now there's Montana and, you know, so many, so many different kinds of brands of spray paint. So, and they're all really good. So, yeah. Awesome. And then our last question before we go ahead and wrap everything up is coming from another one of our instructors, uh, Don Whitesinger, who says hello. Oh, uh, hey, Don. <laughs> uh, he would like to know, obviously, I'm sure it's a pitch for himself too, but uh, who, what Native artists have inspired your work? <laughs> um, no pressure to say Don. <laughs> uh, Gemma Beta, I think probably like thinking of just like off the top of top of my my brain um Jim Abeda when I first saw his paintings and really what he was doing um I think uh, like having this kind of illustrator but also being able to capture some of our creation stories and just the masterfulness of his ability was super inspiring and really started making me think about, um, I don't know, the secret lives of our stories, you know, <laughs> or just like the secret lives of, of, of our ancestors, you know, and, and, and the way they look and the way they think and the way that they would be in this situation that we hear about. So, um, I just always really appreciated his his ability to to capture that. Um, I really love Pablito Velarde's work, um, and most of these are like il illustrator illustrator uh, you know painters. But I just think she had a really clear way of. Um, of you know capturing images and and uh you know making making small stories but that were also like very delicate and i also i just think that um from her daughters the succession and influence of her work and then seeing the way that her daughter's works have evolved was also really inspiring because they look nothing like their moms and i really appreciate that also um, because to me that shows that her influence was beyond the imagery that she was making and it was really about her her ideas and her philosophy that implemented her children so yeah I think that that kind of sums it up <laughs> no it, you know that just um, we are really appreciative of your ability to take the time out and uh, talk to us despite the fact that we have these, um, you know, everything that's going on right now with the pandemic. And so we really appreciate you joining in with us and, um, and you know, just keep up the amazing work. It's, it's just wonderful to see this type of work that's, you know, just out in public. It's really one of the things that I, that I, I, I appreciate when we can see when you talk about the public access right you know I mean what could be more public than that and so so I truly appreciate you and I'm sure that everybody in our zoom room as well as on our Danae College Facebook live page uh, Kayla is there anything you would like to add before we jump off just thank you so much we really do appreciate it Monaba. and just you coming from Chinle is really inspiring saying that like she's from Chinle we can do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think so. I'm always, I'm always impressed by, by the artwork that, that comes, through, um, comes out of, you know, I think, I think we just have, we have like a, an, you know, we're embedded with um, very complex ways of seeing the world and representing that through our art and I mean, that even comes across in our, our traditional forms and the way that we dance and the way that we even handle handle everything. So 
um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of really, really good dinner artists. Mom. Um, Mom. So, but thank you, everybody, <laughs> for having me here. And I, this was really fun. <laughs> I really, I really like doing this. So thank you. Hey, 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 young man.